Hi, my name is uh, Steve Farias, and I'm a speech comm graduate student at Southern Illinois University of Carbondale. And this week, Benny asked me to speak about uh, sports and their potentially productive nature for the Critical Praxis Channel. Sports, as Bob Krizik states in the introduction to the 2008 Special Issue of Western Journal of Communication, occupies a, a specific national interest in the United States of American context. He states that on an any given weekend, sports will be consumed by more people than those who go to church or have sex, which for him indicates that we have an actual situation in the U.S. American culture where sports really does serve to to naturalize certain discourses and naturalize certain identities. As uh, Michael Kimmel states in his book Guyland, in the United States, white, middle-class young men, i.e. men like myself, experience a sense of fragmentation that sports participation in some way alleviates. Baffled by the riddles of quote-unquote manhood and responsibility, uh, men like myself submit to the guy code, where locker room behaviors, sexual conquests, bullying, and a cocky jock position can rule over the sacrifice and conformity called upon us for marriage and family. Um, and as a member of this demographic, uh, I was a fraternity member, I played sports in grade school, high school, all the way up through intramurals in college. Um, I recognize that I speak from a relative position of power and privilege, and yet as I reflect on my own experience, I believe that sports as a form of cultural communication provided me and provides other bodies with pragmatic skills and emotions to agentically struggle with the structural forms of social inclusion and exclusion. It is this struggle that I hope to highlight briefly uh, as the productive potential sports offers. Traditionally, sports privileges the able body and the able mind. This is colloquially evident in the dichotomy between black and white football quarterbacks, where black quarterbacks are often referred to as potential physical specimens and freaks, where white quarterbacks are labeled as more cerebral. Thus, racial stigma intersects with the implicit stigma of which bodies are even able to participate in sports. However, I don't think that all sports participation necessarily reifies these problematic discourses. As Kurt Lindemann and James Turney discuss in their article on masculinity and disability in wheelchair rugby, the social stigma of disability can be challenged through sports participation. In their analysis, quad rugby players find participation empowering and rehabilitating as they're able to share experiences, discuss adaptive practices, and communicate acceptance of their condition. In fact, the rugby lifestyle provides an empowering view of disability that resists the ableist expectations of the disabled body. However, quad rugby players also, through their athleticism and hypermasculinity, move towards more acceptance in an ableist and heterosexist culture, demonstrating that they don't necessarily smash stereotypes so much as they communicate that ableist constructs do not apply to the players very easily. And so research like this, I think, highlights how individuals and social struggles through participation in sports provides historically excluded bodies an opportunity for social inclusion and recognition. Through participation in wheelchair rugby, quad rugby players challenge the exclusionary social norms about sports and the norms about which bodies are able to participate in sports, suggesting the need for critical and further investigation as to how sports might enable us to challenge other forms of exclusion at a social and structural level. Michael, Worth, Michael Butterworth points out in many of his articles that to deny that sports are political is to lend tacit consent to the discourse of a dominant political order. Sports are political and participation in sports can lead to specific affective practices. Growing up, I enjoyed playing sports. I played baseball, football, basketball, and I learned about commitment, loyalty, camaraderie, self-discipline, and how to participate with others in a social setting. And although I was always taught that you weren't supposed to cry on the field, the amount of emotions that we expressed on the field were never limited so long as we were doing it in a team atmosphere geared to a common goal. Now, I also understand how certain players are categorized because as a small pudgy kid and still a small broad person, I am often labeled as not that athletic. And that's not just because I am a speech comm major. And so growing up, I loved playing sports, but I was never the star athlete and I was never seen as the body that could do anything. And so although I was never a person with a disability, I was also never the most able-bodied person on the team. However, as my coaches categorized me, I was always the effort player, the person who had more heart and desire, the Rocky Balboa, if you will. Although I always got punched and beat up and knocked down, I always got back up and gave 100%. And I remember coaches telling other players that if they could take my heart and put it with those players' potential, they would have star athletes on their team. 
Now at the time, I never really questioned these categorizations because I just enjoyed playing and I thought really that this was the type of person that I was supposed to be. But as I look back on it now, it served two functions that I think I wanted to highlight at the end of this. The first is, is that sports enabled me to find skills and emotions and express them in both a competitive atmosphere but also my everyday life. I took this idea that it was about the heart and the desire and the dedication I put to something and applied it to debate when I got into high school and college because I couldn't compete at a level with other bodies. However, when I did it in debate, the devotion and dedication were recognized by other individuals and I recognize it today in the people that I coach in debate. And I think that that also applies in my academia. I try and put as much effort as I can into things and I learn how to do that from sports. And I think other people learn that as well. Whether they're quad rugby players or small catchers playing Little League Baseball, we learn that it's important to give an effort to a common goal. It just so happens that my common goal is finding a way to deconstruct and hopefully be critical of discourses that are very much privileged in our society. But the second thing I think that I learned from sports that is important is that although I kept giving 100%, I also recognized that it wasn't just effort that mattered, but rather whose effort mattered. And now as I look back on it, I was definitely given more opportunities because of where I went to school, because of the sports I played, because of the players I played with. When we played Little League Baseball, there was a draft, but we never really thought as kids much about how that draft functioned. But what really happened was kids that were given the best, teams were given the best players by coaches that were privileged because they paid more money to the league. And so thinking about how sports participation can help, I think now that as adults, when we look back on it, we can be better informed about how our own participation in sports, but also how the participation of future generations in sports can, one, enable the body that has typically been excluded to be included, and again, whether that's wheelchair rugby or finding other ways to include people in sports at a young age and as they get into high school, I think is very important because it does teach these skills of working and relating and being able to express an affective emotion, as Kimmel points out, that we don't get to express elsewhere. But second, it also introduces students to critical discourses that they wouldn't otherwise be a part of, i.e. when you have to relate and interact with people that you wouldn't otherwise interact with, when you look back on those experiences, hopefully, or with more investigation into sports and the productive potential it provides, we'll be able to continue seeing how sports, although problematic in many ways and privileging a heteronormative discourse at a very traditional and broad social level, can be used for productive ways and can be used in politically viable ways to keep advancing issues of social justice. So I hope this discussion has been informative. And I hope that as you go forward, you'll continue to be interested in discussions of sports, ways that sports interact at a social level with different national movements, say with 9-11, discourses of purity, with uh, people of disabilities, and other situations where, although it didn't seem readily available, sports provided an avenue for rehabilitation and an avenue for empowerment that didn't otherwise exist for other individuals.